as votes are being counted. Angola's ruling party claims victory. How one Yali fellow is working to bring free medical care to poor communities in Nigeria. And could this device help reduce your medical bills? Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening, I'm Esther Gidu, you at Info Vincent Macquarie. This is Africa 54. Angola's ruling party says it has won a majority in the country's election, even as votes are still being counted. The MPLA says it has reviewed data delayed by, relayed by its delegates from polling stations nationwide. Party officials say this opens the way for Defense Minister Joao Lorenzo to succeed President Jose Eduardo dos Santos, who is stepping down after 38 years in power. The opposition, UNITA party, says results from its own account completely contradict the ruling party's assertion of victory. Meanwhile, observers and the Electoral Commission say the election was calm and orderly. and official results could emerge by Friday, but full official voting results may not be available until next month. Saudi Arabia is showcasing its military prowess as pilgrims around the world begin converging on the Muslim holy city of Mecca for the annual Hajj pilgrimage. Saudi security forces marched through parade ground in Mecca on Wednesday and put on a mock demonstration of thwarting an attack. It's aimed at showing their readiness with terror attacks always a concern. Between two and three million Muslims from around the world travel to Mecca each year for the pilgrimage which each able-bodied Muslim is supposed to undertake at least once in their lifetime. Former Yemeni President Ali Abdullah Saleh has rallied thousands of supporters in the capital Sana'a in a show of force amid an unusual public rift within the alliance fighting a Saudi-led coalition for control of the country. Fighters loyal to the armed Houthi movement which runs northern Yemeni, Yemen together with Saleh decried him as evil a day earlier and condemned his description of them as a militia. Thursday's rally went ahead despite warnings from the Houthi leadership to Saleh's supporters that any mass gatherings should be made on battlefronts, not in public squares. The former president addressed the rally saying, quote, we're ready to fill the fronts with thousands of fighters and they're ready to go. The tactical alliance between Saleh and the Houthis has often appeared fragile with two groups sharing little ideological ground and always suspicious of each other's motives. U.S.-Egypt relations could hang in the balance after the United States withheld millions of dollars in aid to Egypt over human rights concerns. The U.S. cut nearly $100 million in economic and military assistance and delayed nearly $200 million more in military financing to Egypt. That country is one of the largest recipients of U.S. foreign aid. Although Cairo's foreign ministry criticized the U.S. decision, it did release a video of a meeting with visiting White House advisor Jared Kushner and Egypt's foreign minister Sameh Shukri. The meeting was reportedly canceled following the U.S. move and Kushner, Kushner President Donald Trump's son-in-law, is in Cairo as part of an effort to revive Middle East peace talks. He also met with Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. A statement from Sisi's office does not mention the aid cut. Instead, it highlights Egypt's desire to work on strengthening relations between the two countries. Trump has embraced Sisi as a key partner in the global war against Islamist extremism, downplaying concerns over his human rights record. Students have arrived at the University of Virginia campus in Charlottesville, Virginia for the start of the fall semester. The school featured in national and international headlines recently following violent rallies that culminated in the death of a young woman who had come to protest against racism. Students and their parents told VOA reporters they were shocked by recent events but determined to ensure the campus and the city of Charlottesville remain a safe place for all. Zlatza Hook has their story. The deadly violence in Charlottesville shocked the nation and it scared the students enrolled at the University of Virginia, also known by its acronym UVA. Minority students like Malia Valentine were especially worried. 
The physical physicality of the events was kind of frightening. But the university has made efforts to reassure minority students they have nothing to fear. Yusuf Baig, a freshman from Houston, Texas, is Muslim. The entire week I constantly got emails from pretty much every department in the school saying they don't support any of this. His mother, who accompanied him to Charlottesville, expressed disappointment that such violence occurred in the city the family believed to be safe and quiet. Uh, it's very, very sad and scary uh, that things like these uh, still happen in America. But giving up the opportunity to attend one of America's best public schools was not an option. She put in the work to get into here at UVA and uh, she deserves the opportunity to go where she wanted to go. It's not an easy school to get in, so I didn't want to deny her that opportunity because of my over being over-concerned. Many hope that the violent rally was an aberration that won't be repeated. And although it was a horrible thing that did happen, um, it started like the talk that needed to happen about uh, what's happening in politics right now, what's accepted and everything, and uh, how to go against that. Bake said there was a stigma against Muslims in the United States after the September 11 terrorist attacks that eased over time. But he said Muslims are now concerned about a new wave of intolerance. Charlottesville resident Kezer Khan came into the spotlight when he criticized then-presidential candidate Donald Trump for proposing travel restrictions for Muslims. Khan's son was killed while serving as a U.S. soldier in Iraq. My son, Captain Himayun Khan, is son of University of Virginia. He studied here. He commissioned here. He learned all the principles, decency of democracy, of constitution, right here in this city, in this blessed city, in this university. Khan wants to remind Americans that it is worth fighting for the values their country stands for, values such as freedom, democracy, and equal rights for all. Zlatica Hoke, VOA News, Washington. President Donald Trump's fellow Republicans have rebuked him for threatening to shut down the U.S. government over funding for a border wall. Trump's remarks rattled financial markets and cast a shadow over congressional efforts to raise the country's debt ceiling and pass spending bills. Top Republican and House Speaker Paul Ryan told reporters he doesn't think anyone is interested in shutting down the government. Well, I don't think a government shutdown is necessary, and I don't think most people want to see a government shutdown, um, ourselves included. And um, Congress in the House has already done its work on this issue. Uh, there are very legitimate problems and concerns in the border that need to be addressed. The House already has passed funding for border security, including building um, physical barriers like a wall in the places that are necessary. While Ryan believes building a wall along the U.S. border with Mexico to deter illegal immigration is necessary, he says the government does not have to choose between border security and shuttering operations. Democrats and some Republicans are still debating whether building the wall is worth the $1.6 billion expense. The president's proposed wall would be 2,700 kilometers away from Capitol Hill. In Del Rio, Texas, residents and law enforcement there say the issue is more complicated than Washington realizes. VOA's congressional reporter Catherine Gibson followed the U.S. Border Patrol to learn more. The Rio Grande, a river split between two countries. It's very simple to get to the river on the Mexican side. It's, it's very shallow. Corey Maddox has watched undocumented immigrants try every way possible to cross it. They'll use rafts, uh, there's, they'll use horses, inner tubes, and they'll just swim. Most led by smugglers beating well-worn paths down to the river. These guys, they've been doing this for a long, long time. The smugglers in the local area, they know the places to cross. Border Patrol watches from the high bluffs above, but the thick Carrizo cane below is treacherous, trapping heat and choking land up to the three kilometers of existing fence. It's, it can be creepy at night, you know, because you don't know the person you're trying to arrest. The Rio Grande River separating the U.S. from Mexico is just one of the areas Border Patrol agents go into. They also track drug smugglers in the high desert and perform search and rescue missions in the canyons here surrounding the Pecos River. Canyons and burning desert, 
that work as well as any wall. It's not a one-size-fits-all border, and what is that right mix in one area may not be the right mix even a short distance uh, away. Matthew Hudak says the problem of border security can't be solved with a simple fix. And even with infrastructure, it's still going to be a personnel intensive uh, area to patrol. Fencing works well in urban areas, but out in the desert. And it takes a trained eye, it takes years to learn that craft. Human eyes and ears work best. It's, it's not easy work. This is one of the most difficult areas in our area to order, in order to track people. It's the terrain that changes the debate about a continuous wall, says local law enforcement. In my county, I don't think that we need a border wall. Sheriff Joe Frank Martinez says there's no danger here and that President Trump would find a different reality in person. People need to step foot on the border. People that are, that are talking need to know what they're talking about. And some Del Rio residents believe Trump does understand that reality. If the guy has got enough sense to make a $9 billion empire to build a building in downtown New York, he's got enough sense where to build a wall. Even though Trump's promise of building a continuous wall is still up for debate back in Washington. Katherine Gibson, VOA News, Del Rio, Texas. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our show live on Facebook. So check us out and share our show with your friends. Also, check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Coming up, the story of a young Nigerian who is working to bring free medical care to poor communities in his country. Stay with us. Health news and notes. This is Living Better. Exhale hands to your heart and grab a goat. That's a command you can hear only at a goat yoga class, a new twist on an old health practice. Uh, goat yoga is a combination of a very serious meditation with the yoga and then a very not so serious meditation with the playful antics of the goat kids. Stan McCoy of Sage Meadow Farm says his goat yoga class sold out immediately the first time it was offered. And we had 120 tickets on the first round of classes and we posted that they were going on sale at 6 o'clock on a certain date and at 6 o'clock 2,000 people tried to buy those tickets. The classes can be inside or outdoors. Instructor Megan McCarthy. There are different ways that people can bring yoga into their lives, and if it includes goats. Then there will be more people in yoga classes and hooves. I'm Martin Seacrest for VOA's Living Better. How do you see the world? I see countries in turmoil. I see our planet changing. I see people at peace. No matter how you see the world, you'll get an unbiased and uncensored view of it on Voice of America, on television, radio, online, and mobile. In more than 40 languages all day, every day, millions of people tune us in. How do I see the world? On Voice of America. And joining us now is Africa 54 health correspondent, Lino Mudu. Hello, Lino. Hello, Esther. Well, it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for many young African men and women, the Yali Mandela Washington Fellowship. The class of 2017 concluded their summit here in the United States recently. 1,000 fellows from Sub-Saharan Africa were placed at schools and organizations throughout the country to network, share experiences, and improve their skills. I sat down with one fellow, Nigerian Dr. Oluwa Shegun Dada Omotoya, founder of the Free Health Initiative, to discuss his work. I'm the founder of an initiative called Free Health Initiative. Uh, I founded the initiative uh, in 2012, and uh, we started work actively in 2013. That in initiative, what it does, the platform through which we organize comprehensive, uh, you know, healthcare services, you know, to those in the rural area. I mean, the underserved population, you know, across Southwest Nigeria. A lot of young men and women, when they come out of medical school, 
sometimes the first idea will be to get a good job as a doctor somewhere and make good money, make good living. That's, that's the idea behind getting an education and everything. But for you, you decided to start this free health initiative, providing free health care yeah. to people in the rural area. Why was it important for you to start this way? It was odd. People say me going in that direction because uh, they felt, you know, I haven't gone through so many things in life. I lost my parents at a very tender age. During my undergraduate training at the University of Ibadan, I made a pledge because I felt God was the one that, you know, saw me through. When it comes to, you know, our healthcare system, it's riddled with corruption, inefficiency, Impunity. You see a lot of preventable death going on here and there. You felt I could be a victim tomorrow. I think that was what really spurred me to establish the initiative. I saw the need. The need was really enormous. And I felt, okay, what am I going to do? Let me empty my account. I made a pledge some years back during my undergraduate training. I must fulfill it now. So tell us about what you're doing now. What we did then was that we organized free medical outreach across the states. We did it for the elderly. And aside that, we also, you know, organized mobile clinic through which we provide, you know, essential healthcare services to the needy. And uh, in addition to that, we operated some people free of charge. Those people that presented with ANIA, we operated them free of charge. And the most striking part of it, you know, the one that really struck me was that there was a woman, you know, who presented with 20 years straight of blindness due to cataracts. We went in and we did the operation for her and she has regained her sight now. So you see the impact of your work. How do you replicate or do you intend to replicate this in other parts of Nigeria and even Africa? That's our vision because uh, we intend trying to broaden our scope, you know, as we, we are done with the fellowship now back home, you know, through our networking, we've been able to have one or two, you know, interactions here or relationship established during the stay. So people are really interested. How has the YALI program shifted your approach to what you're already doing, if it has, or what have you learned? I really learned a lot during my stay here, you know, ranging from being a servant leader, you know, how to, you know, organize a successful project, how to collaborate, how to network, how to invite people, you know, that will surely, you know, collaborate with a view to actualize the dreams of any project. At least 200 million girls and women have undergone female genital cutting in 30 countries. According to UNICEF, 44 million of them are 14 years old and younger. One group of Kenyan teens is standing up against the practice. They're offering would-be victims a possibly life-saving alternative with an app. Diana Mitchell reports from Silicon Valley. It's still fresh in my mind the scene of female genital mutilation. The pain of having your clitoris cut simply because someone wants to have you go through a rite of passage. It's painful and no one wants to listen to you. You cry and there you are almost dying, but nobody is caring about that. These teenage girls from Kenya call themselves the restorers. Although their tribe does not practice female genital mutilation, or FGM, they are pitching a technology they developed to help other girls fight back against the archaic custom where all are part of a woman's clitoris is cut out. I think for teenagers to be able to identify problems around them and provide a solution, that is really, really inspiring. The Kenyan teens participated in the Technovation Challenge which invites girls from around the world to compete using technology to solve problems in their communities. They created an app called iCut, allowing victims to send for help if they suspect they might be the target of FGM. 200 million girls in 30 countries have been cut, Africa, the Middle East, and Asia, where FGM is concentrated. Therefore, FGM is a global concern. I had a friend who had to drop out of school because of female genital mutilation. And uh, I, when I got the chance to work on this application, I, I had to do it because of what happened to my friend. Though their app has the potential to save lives, 
it has not been embraced by all Kenyans. One uh, village elder drove six hours to their school to protest the app because according to him that's an African culture and uh, the girls are being, according to him, westernized. The new app comes at a time when some are protesting women in technology, and not just in Kenya, but even at the Google headquarters where the competition is being held. Google CEO Sundar Pichai made an unplanned appearance at the event. Uh, I know the journey won't always be easy, uh, but to the girls who dream of being an engineer or an entrepreneur and who dream of creating amazing things, I want you to know that there's a place for you in this industry. There's a place for you at Google. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. The Restorers did not win Technovation Challenge, but they will continue their fight against FGM and hope to get their app into the Google Play Store soon. Dina Mitchell for VOA News, Mountain View, California. And that's our health report for today. So stay in touch. For more, find me on Twitter at Lina Hundu. Back to you, Esther. And thank you, Lino, for joining us today. Be sure to watch for Lino Mudu every Tuesday and Thursday for the latest health news in Africa, right here on Africa 54. It's time now for a short break still to come on Africa 54. Could this device replace your doctor? We'll be right back. made me cope during that time was painting because I'm into abstract art and that's how I could express how I was feeling at the time. Welcome back to Africa 54. Here's what's trending. An Israeli telemedicine company is looking to replace some of face-to-face -face doctor visits with a new device that allows patients an accurate self-examination from home. With Taitu, patients can measure their own heart rate or temperature, as well as conduct examinations of organs that require more accuracy, such as ears, throat, and lungs. The accompanying Taitu app uses alog al algorithms and visual recognition technologies to guide users to conduct even complicated examinations. It also allows the clinician to interact with the patient online or offline, storing that patient's data and using it to improve health care. Next up, as the draw for the second largest Powerball jackpot in U.S. history approaches, mobile lottery company Lottery.com has launched a mobile app and global lottery platform. The Lottery.com app allows users to play the Powerball truck tickets as well as get results and jackpot notifications right from their phone. The company has also released results from a national survey in which 60% of lottery players expressed a desire for mobile lottery access. 63% say they play the lottery when the jackpot is high. The survey also found the majority of people would like the ability to play the lottery from their smartphones. 
and use digital tools to monitor lottery results. And finally, the ancient Romans are renowned for their endurance of their buildings, with structures more than 2,000 years old still standing today. Now scientists have discovered the secret to what makes so many of them near eternal concrete. It's a formula that the Romans perfected uh, well before the times of Jesus Christ, and it makes the buildings become stronger and stronger as time passes. The secret ingredient is seawater. In fact, concrete made with seawater becomes so strong, it is considered a suitable material to house radioactive waste, and that's what's trending today. Now, the Nazi symbol, known as the swastika, was on display in Charlottesville, Virginia, during a white supremacist rally earlier this month that led to violence and division in the U.S. It sparked a national debate about how to respond. In Germany, where the swastika is banned, a group of graffiti activists have taken it upon themselves to transform that symbol of hate into something beautiful and positive. Faiza El Masri tells us how Faith Lapidus narrates. When Berlin's graffiti artists need supplies to express their thoughts on walls around the city, many come here. Ibo Omari runs the Legacy Art Supply Store and the Cultural Heirs Youth Club, a forum for young artists to exchange ideas on how to use art as a weapon against hate messages and symbols like the swastika. It was important to spur young people into action and to encourage them to take responsibility so they don't just ignorantly walk past such symbols of hatred. Rather, inform the owner or those responsible that a hateful symbol is emblazoned on the wall, and that puts them under pressure to remove it. When they don't do that, we offer our help and say, we would like to beautify it. In all cases without exception, we got the permission and agreement of the owner or those responsible and could beautify it without involving the bureaucratic process. In 2015, a man came into Omari's shop for some spray paint to cover a swastika in a park where his son was playing. Two weeks later, Omari says he was shocked to hear about more swastikas painted in a skate park. That's what motivated him. 16-year-old Philip is one of the young artists in Omari's Paint Back initiative. He's involved because he believes racism has no place in his country. When tourists come to Berlin and look at a wall and see a swastika, they'll think, what's going on here? There are Nazis everywhere, and we don't want that. An artistic symbol obviously looks much nicer than an ugly message, and then people walk through the city with a smile on their faces. A promotional video for the Paint Back initiative highlights some of the 25 swastikas in Berlin the group has transformed. The program is now being copied in other German cities. For writer Faiza El Masri, I'm Faith Lapidus, VOA News. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website. Good night from Washington. to English in a Minute. An alley is a narrow path between or behind buildings. Up one's alley. Does this expression have to do with city streets? Jonathan, do you have any friends who teach singing? Um, hello. I am a singer. You are? Oh, awesome. Do you 